Hello, and welcome once again to the Newburyport Documentary Film Festival and our monthly Watch Club series, um, where we talk with the directors of some of the most intriguing documentaries that are currently streaming. I'm program director James Sullivan. Uh, welcome to our viewers. Uh, and we are very proud to have the filmmaker behind Mama's Boy, relatively new film uh, that premiered recently on HBO. Laurent Buzero is with us to talk about the film. Yeah, the film is a really moving uh, story about the uh, Oscar winning screenwriter, uh, Dustin Lance Black, who is the, uh, some of you may know, is the filmmaker or the screenwriter behind the, uh, the amazing film Milk. Um, we're going to introduce uh, Laurent in just a moment. And we're going to, before we talk to Laurent, we're going to show the trailer just in case any of you have not actually had a chance to see Mama's Boy yet. And before we do that, what I'd like to do is just to uh, tell you briefly about what we have coming up for next month's Watch Club in December. We have uh, Ian Hayden Smith, who is the, we will be having, Ian Hayden Smith, who's a British writer who has uh, just written and published this book called Well Documented, The Essential Documentaries That Prove the Truth is More Fascinating Than, fi That Truth is More Fascinating Than Fiction. I've been saying that for years. It's absolutely true. This is a really cool book. Um, this is a, a little bit of a departure for us here in the Watch Club. We obviously always talk to filmmakers uh, about their documentaries, but next month we're going to be talking to Ian about his book about documentaries. So uh, if you are so inclined and if you haven't already done so on YouTube, go ahead and ring the bell uh, to uh, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel and get uh, reminders about our upcoming events. Um, and uh, let's get right into our conversation with Laurent. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at the trailer for Mama's Boy. I first heard the story of Harvey Milk when I was a closeted teenager. What I didn't know yet was that I would write the screenplay to tell that story. And it changed the course of my life. I loved telling stories. And I took every opportunity I could to tell gay stories. But if you're Mormon, you know you're going to hell. I was terrified. I knew that that day would eventually come, where if she found out, I would lose my mom. My mom was a fighter. She grew up with polio immobilized permanently from the chest down. She decided, well, I want to have a family and I want to have kids and a good job and all the things that she'd been told she couldn't have. She was my best friend. I had to tell her. She just said, why? Why would you choose this? I looked at her braces. I said, why did you choose those? And it was just silent. She showed the curiosity to share a space with my queer friends and to listen. That's how powerful story in a shared space is. You start to change. The day after the Oscars, my mom said a promise is a sacred thing. So what are you going to do? So I got to work. I was now in a fight for marriage equality. I started to think perhaps the way to crack things open is to follow my mom's example. My mom met with my friends, people who she thought and had been taught were just too different than her. It's getting harder to get in the same room with people you love but disagree with. Share space build bridges. This is the power my mom taught me. Laurent Buzero, welcome to the Watch Club. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Um, I want to mention briefly to those who are watching us live um, during this interview that if you care to ask your own question of Laurent, um, I'll help you do that. Just type it up in the comments section. And uh, so, uh, um, you know, start thinking about what you might like to ask Laurent. But in the meantime, I'm going to I'm going to ask Laurent a few questions. Um, we started talking a few minutes ago before the program started, Laurent, about the obvious question about how this film got made in the first place. How did you uh, and Lance first get together on this film? I was kind of under the impression that maybe he had reached out to you. Not the case, right? 
No, another case. I reached out to him. Uh, you know, right. I was looking for a new project. I was I was just finishing a film and and I, I'm constantly reading books and looking for stuff. And I, I was uh, actually in New York uh, and uh, working on Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. And uh, during my weekend, I went to a bookstore and I saw this book, Mama's Boy by Lance. And I, I read it over the weekend. And I just literally, I mean, one of those cliche things to say, you know, I couldn't put it, put it down. Then there was something very universal, even though it was very, very singular story. There was something very universal about, about uh, his story. And I, I immediately saw it as a film. I was, I, I was immediately seeing images and photos and, 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 and a journey. Uh, um, and so I, I sent him a, a text on, um, on Instagram and lo and behold, he, he responded and he's like, Oh, I know your work and I love, mm. you know, your stuff and let's chat. So we got on zoom and, and he gave me an option to the book. The thing that was interesting is that, um, uh, Playtone, which is Tom Hanks's company and Ron Howard's company had approached him to do a narrative film based on the book. Oh. Um, and he had said, um, no, uh, I'd rather explore as a documentary. And when I, you know, connected with him, it sort of confirmed to him that there could be interest in, in, in this as a documentary. So uh, we, uh, we partnered, you know, in, in trying to, uh, to, set, to set it up and, and uh, Playtone, Amblin, and a company called LD joined forces with us, and um, they it was financed entirely by this company called LD Entertainment, and uh, filmed it in 14 days, which was insane, and uh, and then HBO bought it, and here we are. So Lance is obviously best known for writing the screenplay to the great film Milk about the San Francisco politician Harvey Milk, who was a uh, uh, inspiring yeah. gay rights activists before he was, you know, murdered in cold blood. I forget what year that was, but um, so Lance knows the world of taking a true story and, you know, um, bringing actors to it, you know, a reenactment. So I'm surprised. I think I'm a little bit surprised to hear you say that he was, he knew from the beginning, I don't want somebody else telling my story or having actors play me and my mom. I want this to be a documentary. Uh, so then it does seem serendipitous that you reached out to him and said, I'd like to make a documentary out of this. And he said, well, I've been thinking that, right? Yeah. And you know, the thing that was crazy is I, I was having dinner with a really good friend of mine yesterday. And she said, you know, watching it, I felt like I was watching a narrative film. <laughs> I was just like, okay, go figure. Uh, right. uh, um, <laughs> it, it, it has that element of so much happened to this one person, you know, to this, to, to Lens, yeah. that if you try to do it as a narrative, it would almost feel like made up, you know? Yeah. Uh, sure. um, so I think maybe in the future there would be room to make it as a narrative. Uh, I don't think that's off the table, but the fact that it was a documentary first, uh, I think was important to him. And it was not an easy thing. I mean, first of all, I, I can say this, that he is... Um, someone who is always in control of his own narrative. And, and, and I said, you know, you're going to have to give that up because I'm the filmmaker and, and, and he was extremely generous in that. Uh, the only feedback I was interested in getting from him was, did I get anything wrong? Are, are there any mistakes in the film? Right. But I wasn't interested in, in knowing what he thought of the film. And, <laughs> and um, he, he was, he was game for that. Mm. Uh, which was very courageous um and uh, um at the same time you know i was extremely uh, uh emotionally present in 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 the way that i was shooting it and the way that we were having a journey we literally designed the journey in 14 days to to start in that little kitchen that you see in the film and we mm -hmm. ended up on the hollywood hills um because that was the arc of the story. So I, mm -hmm. I, I filmed it in the order of, if you will, continuity in a sense, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I recreated for him his, his childhood and, and his growing up and his success and everything. And, and 
And then at some point, you know, we were going to places that were so dark, you know, where he was nearly uh, uh, killed by his stepfather and things that were just so, so dark mm -hmm. that he kind of lost it. And we had to kind of, you know, I, I realized, oh, my God, this is this is life. This is true life we're talking about. And 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 so we, we paused, you, you know, just for a few hours and, and, and then uh, started again. But it was very affecting and the crew got very affected by the stories we were telling and and we were all crying and it was it was really really tough and one of my crew members came to me and said i have to talk to you and and so i stepped out and he said i have to leave the movie i'm like what and he's like i i'm i just found out i have cancer and the story mm. is about cancer and i can't listen to this and it's mm affected me luckily he's okay and uh, um mm. but he did leave the film and i had to adjust to that and so i was i was really getting the sense you know that we were living something that hopefully you know uh people watching the film would would feel that it's a very uh, well lived <laughs> you know documentary not only by nature of what it's about but everything was so thought out to the point where in that little kitchen that you see at the beginning of the film, there's mm -hmm. this turquoise kind of motif color. I tried to reproduce that color in mm -hmm. most of the interviews with the families, even in post, I did some VFX to mm -hmm. connect everyone visually. You know, there's this horrible expression in that I hear sometimes, oh, talking heads. And I'm like, what? <laughs> this is not talking head this is i'm a talking head right now but those are <laughs> close-ups they're close-ups on, yeah. on people when you watch a regular film and you see a close-up on someone you don't say oh there well, was a, a bunch head, right? of white spots and a bunch of talking heads <laughs> that's a good uh, point um, and, and and you know it's so much went into the composition of those shots and and um, and again, I'm not saying I succeeded, but I'm just saying a lot of love and, and care uh, went into the filmmaking aspect because I treat those people as 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 uh, you you know they're real people, but they're also characters in the story. Mm -hmm. And so if 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 I can do anything to to enhance the narrative by making it interesting, uh, even if it's subliminal. Uh, like the the green colors or the uh, turquoise color, it's so it's so important to me, you know. Well, the love and care comes through loud and clear, and I think the other you mentioned earlier um, another very important point that it's definitely Lance's story and his mom's story, so it's very personal and, and intimate, but it also is very much a universal story. He, you know. Um, we, we have a couple of comments um, from viewers. Um, Carol says, uh, healing such divisions in this country and in religion should be our top priorities. And uh, Jean says, thank you for introducing me to this documentary. I loved it. Shared spaces, build bridges. Yes. So, I mean, yeah. it is absolutely a very important story about, um, you know, the bigger picture of how do we have difficult conversations with friends and family and loved ones who maybe don't agree with uh, certain things about each other. Um, and uh, this, this story does an extremely good job of doing that. And Lance is so fierce about his commitment to making that happen after spending so many years apart from his family because he felt unwanted. Right. Um, yeah. to, to what extent did you two have that conversation? Like, um, was he already committed to it or did you have to draw that out of him? Like that idea about how, um, you know, the shared spaces, um, thing is so important, um, way beyond his own personal story. Well, you know, I, I fell in love with this story because there was the micro story, which is him. And there yep. was the macro aspect of it, which is division and what's happening also in the world as we speak, you know. So uh, I, I told him that that was my goal to constantly have that back and forth in the narrative where you always felt, yeah, we're talking about him, but we're talking about this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was understood. And everyone who participated uh, uh, was, was game 
for that and to be put on the spot and and um, a lot of them have had you know like his cousin you know have had a journey because of him and because of what he's become you know uh, um, so so that was that was always important for me to underline in in a way that that would be inspiring that you need to to have dialogue and it's not because you're different that you can't have that dialogue or because you don't vote the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I know that people have said that the film is very naive and uh, potentially, you know, uh, blindlessly naive. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think you're ever naive when you're, you're, uh, and, and I'm the proof of that. I mean, I have, uh, you know, a family where, where uh, uh, we're very, very different. Um, and um, I was more afraid of having the dialogue than once the dialogue happened, you know, of what could happen if I said this and that about myself or uh, um, so. So I think, you know, fear guides you in a way that is not always productive. And mm -hmm. I think the fear way, if it can inspire people, uh, you know, on, on the on the bright side, I've had people who, who have said, I need to go see my mom and tell her I love her mm -hmm. to people saying I, I need to go to my parents and I need to come out or I need to have more confidence in myself. And, and I'm not going to no longer talk to someone so because they don't vote the same way I do. Mm -hmm. I, I've had that, this incredible gamut of, of, of reaction. So it's a good feeling in the end, you know, and, mm -hmm. and yes, it was very deliberate you know, to, to highlight uh, um, those themes. Although I'm hoping not in a pedestrian kind of way, not in a preachy kind of way, you know, in a way that was guided by this very singular story of love and mother-son relationship. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Gene who wants to know, did Lance feel like he was closer to his mom than his siblings were? Or was she that way with all of them? Was she that much of an advocate for all of her kids? Um, you know, uh, that's a great question. I think that there was definitely a, a closeness uh, that was very different from the one that she had with Todd, who was the youngest, and Marcus, who was the eldest. Right. Um, I think you know, as we say in the film, you know, Marcus sort of, uh, of, of drifted, uh, right. apart. Um, but Lance, uh, and her were definitely, there was something more, mm -hmm. you know, you get that sense. And it's mm -hmm. not to say that she loved one over the other. I, I, right. I think when she lost her son to cancer, her eldest, you know, it was, I mean, you know, we talk about it in the film, but like in real life, when I talk to those who knew them, I mean, the devastation was was beyond, you know, what we depicted. So uh, um, I think she loved them all equally. But I think that because Lance um, was, you know, he's a very singular guy uh, that that maybe that that got them closer well it's um, called mama's boy for a reason you know, the story's called mama's yeah. boy for a reason right <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean i think i think that marcus closed himself off so there was right. no no that relationship and and todd was just you you know uh um you, you know maybe like too young you know at the time but but uh lance felt like he was the protector you know once yeah. marcus started drifting and, and um, what he witnessed made him more the patriarch in a sense, you know? I, I, I and my wife have three boys. And, uh, you know, there's always one, you know, that needs the mom more than the others. You know, I mean, Marcus didn't want it. And Todd probably didn't need it. And uh, Lance clearly needed his mom, you know? And um, yeah. and she was there for him. That's amazing, you know? How were the, how see, was it? Go ahead. I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I'm super close to both my parents, but growing up, I was definitely closer to my mom. 
um, and so I could relate to that. And I, I don't think it's a it's a negative on 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 dad or anything like this. It's just uh, right. you, you know something that happens. Just sure. like you know, I'm very close to my two sisters, but I was more you know drawn to my younger sister. We did more stuff together. My older sister was more independent, but it doesn't mean I loved one over the other. It's exactly. very complex, you know. Anyways, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's fine. Tell us uh, if you can. Well, yeah, tell us if you can about the, um, you know, the scenes, obviously, with the family. Um, he had had those kinds of conversations, obviously, with them prior to you bringing a camera crew. So they were used to it to some extent. Right. But then you bring in a camera crew and it's a whole other ball game, Right. I mean, it, it's just different. Um Was it uncomfortable or or was everybody I think you said earlier that everybody was game for it. Right. Uh, so I, I did do some pre-interviewing with some of them uh, because I, I, you know, realizing that those people have never been in front of a camera, I didn't quite know what to expect. And there were some that I, I just wanted to make sure that whomever sat down was going to be able to talk, right? Because mm -hmm. there's nothing worse. I have to tell you, I was so apprehensive when we landed in Texarkana. I was just like, oh, my God, I, I, I'm so scared about tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. and you know, knowing the book and the whole background, I was just like, you know, I, I wasn't, I, 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 I was not expecting the sort of, I sat down first with the cousin, you know, and it just felt like I, you know, something happens to me physically, like where I channel the person. And mm -hmm. that sounds, I'm, I'm sure, very pretentious, but I, I literally, become that person and and mm -hmm. it's not an interview it's almost like i'm i'm speaking their truth and they mm -hmm. get it and i'm not judging them mm -hmm. i wasn't i'm never out to judge someone even i've done interviews with people that i don't necessarily respect you know uh I, I, but never do i try to to have this go on the attack you know mm -hmm. i was I wanted them to feel comfortable. I wanted them to embrace me. I wanted them to to feel like they could trust me, and it happened instantaneously. I, I'm mm -hmm. not lying. You know, I felt extremely uh, um, at ease. You, you know, they were in that home that had always been in their family. Uh, there are so much memories. I'm getting goosebumps just saying this. I'm a very tactile kind of person, you know. So I walked around the home by myself and I was, I saw a table that the dad had built, you know, who obviously had passed on. I went into the shed when there was a, a, a jar with, um, with glass little things. And I'm, I'm just looking at objects, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I just felt... And, and, you know, they would cook and they would smell like cinnamon. I don't know. I was my, my whole senses were embracing the, the 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 setting and it was very transformative for me. You know, I just felt very at ease. And my crews are guys that I, I, I've worked with for a long time um, and uh, they know my style and they know. Uh, when when I'm focused, you know, and uh, uh, we just have a rhythm together, which is super important, especially in those circumstances, you know. And the second we started filming, it just it just felt very uh, I, I hate that word, but very organic, you know. Mm. Except <laughs> when Lance, you know, got super intense because he was going back to extremely painful memories and uh, yeah. and you know um it's hard like you have your brain like oh my god we have one day here one day there we have to take a plane we have to you know i need to get all this stuff so 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 it it shook me in the sense like come back to earth forget about the schedule now you're dealing with real life you know Laurent, you're talking about, you know, sort of channeling the folks that you uh, have on camera in your documentaries. And we have a good question from Lindsay who asks, um, do, do, do you feel like you need to share something of yourself with those people that you're interviewing uh, in order to do their story justice? Do you need to share yourself or do you sort of like stay, remain the, you know, sort of uh, behind the camera guy who doesn't give up anything about your own personal story um, in order to tell theirs? Wow. Um, 
I think that that I I get extremely emotional if if somebody tells me a story of loss and you know I've had that happen when I did Natalie Wood I mean I literally start crying I, st- I literally mm-hmm. you, you know I get very very emotional it's very hard for me to contain my mm-hmm. emotions uh no I go in with as much knowledge of the story that I want them to tell me so in this case I had of course, the benefit of the book, which told all those great stories. So they were actually shocked that I knew them better than they thought I did, you know. <laughs> and um, I think that by showing my genuine emotions as I'm talking to them, they connect with me and they know that I have empathy and they know that um, I get it because I relate, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't try to, uh, to say, oh, I remember when that happened to me that I I don't do that. But I'll say things like, I don't know. uh, um, I remember when I first came to America and I discovered this and that, and you're talking about this, tell me about it, because that's one aspect of American culture that attracted me. So uh, Mm -hmm. that would be like the only time that I would insert myself into the narrative, you know, Mm -hmm. as a way to get information, you know, from them. But uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I, I try to be more the audience in a sense. If I'm moved and I'm crying, it means that it will move at least one person Mm -hmm. (laughs) outside of me. Uh, um, And, and suddenly they, they feel very comfortable um, uh, and, 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 you know, very quickly, the interview is, is literally a discussion. It, it's, mm-hmm. and sometimes it becomes a monologue where they're like, I, I know where you're going. I know what you want, you know? Right. And they can and almost never, kind of, you know, I try to never make it technical like oh do you mind repeating my questions and your answers and do you mind da 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 if if they've said something great and they didn't say it right i will do it completely at the end i said just just from my editor who will drive me crazy can you just re-say this you know <laughs> but i don't try to interrupt the flow you know mm-hmm. even if they say something even there is noise or whatever i try to really i mean literally i forget there is anything outside myself and that person you know um we're going to wrap up in a minute but i want to ask you one last thing which is kind of off topic thanks so much for sharing your stories about making mama's boy um and your partnership with lance on doing this um but when before we came on live on the program we were talking a little bit about your background prior to that you worked on the natalie wood documentary for hbo but you've also worked for decades basically right for steven spielberg and his production company making sort of behind the scenes documentaries and things and the question that i asked you was um, have you seen the Fablemans? What did you think of it? The new film, feature film that Spielberg made about his own, uh, which is autobiographical. It's about his own childhood and his own introduction to filmmaking and why he's so invested in it. Um, so I'll ask mm-hmm. you that for the audience here. Um, can you tell us what you're, you know, for those of you who are interested in seeing the Fablemans and haven't seen it yet, like like me, um, can you c- kind of repeat what you told me? Uh, uh, a half an hour ago about um, the film and why maybe it was moving for you. I don't remember what I said, but <laughs> I, I, cried, I cried from beginning to end. I mean, literally. That's what you even said. Though, <laughs> even though that clearly I'm not Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, um, I related to his story, uh, uh, the story in The Fablemans, because it's all about discovering passion. And that is yeah. just so moving to me. It's about discovering an art form. It's about discovering a new language and mm-hmm. learning on how to use it uh, in the face of reality, which is mm-hmm. family, and in the face of narrative, which is storytelling, which is what mm-hmm. Stephen is the greatest at, is, 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 is his gift is to, to have been able to embrace life so that it could turn into incredible storytelling that we can all relate to. I mean, he is more than a filmmaker, he's a humanist. Sure. The only one on earth who who, who has managed to be both uh, um, wow. tell stories that we can all relate to that, you, you know, I mean, if you said, you know, where do you want to go 
when when you die, you know, I want to go into a Spielberg movie because um, <laughs> that's that's where imagination lives. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's amazing. OK, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, once again, it was a pleasure talking to you where I could go on and on, but, uh, you know, I'll let everybody get on with their evenings. Um, those of you in the audience, um, if you enjoyed the discussion, uh, tell your friends, uh, the, the, this will be archived on our, on the Newbury Report documentary film festivals, YouTube channel, which is easy enough to find. Um, so tell your friends if they want to check it out. Um, you know, uh, and, and absolutely, if you haven't already watched mama's boy, please do, because it's very moving as Laurent just described. Um, thanks again, Laurent. Have a great evening. Um, we'll have to have you back on with, with your next project. And yes. uh, let's just uh, let's just say, uh, you know, we'd like to just make sure that we thank our sponsors before we sign out. We'll see you next month in the Watch Club.